back in Greece. There's nothing ordinary about this place. And I was going to say an extraordinary country, an extraordinary people, but most of all, an extraordinary level of hospitality. And, and in 2014 and 2015, I spent a year circumnavigating the Mediterranean Sea. And in that year, I went through 17 countries in 13,000 kilometers. And I came to Greece twice. Once I planned, once I didn't. And the planned journey is when I came out of Turkey in my sea kayak, and I traveled the whole of the Greek coast over 50 days from Alexandropoulou in the east, right the way to Sagiada and into Albania in the west. And then nine months later, I found myself in a little rowing boat from Tunisia, trying to row across the Mediterranean from Tunisia to Cyprus to Turkey. But the winter storms had other ideas and pushed us like a little plastic bottle on the sea across north, and we landed on the Peloponnese. And here I was in Greece a second time. So where of those 17 countries I went to do you think was my favorite? Sorry, was that Spain, you said? Or? Greece. I mean, where else do you get your own personalized Greek salad? But it's because I love Greece so much that I feel comfortable enough to tell you that you've got a problem. You've got a big problem. And you're not alone in having that problem, but I hope you'll come on a bit of a journey with me now and see if we can find some solutions. Water. Water is the most ordinary of things. Without water, we have no life on Earth. And indeed, when we go beyond Earth, when we go and seek for life in the universe, we look for signs of water. But plastic, plastic is the most extraordinary of items. It's an invention that's come to dominate our lives in the last 50 years. And you just need to look around you, wherever you are, look around you in this amazing auditorium and look around for plastic. But we've come in recent years to understand that Plastic is perhaps not quite so fantastic, and it has some problems. First and foremost amongst, it's really, really hard to get rid of the stuff. And about 40 years ago, my uncle Dan, who sadly passed away last year, age 90, he gave me my first pile of old secondhand camping equipment, an old tent, a stove, a sleeping bag, and in that was this orange plastic mug. And this orange plastic mug has been with me on every journey and every expedition that I've done over the last 40 years. It's been up Himalayan summits. It's been across the deserts of Australia. It's been down long, long river journeys, and it came for a year around the Mediterranean with me. And this mug has been used thousands and thousands and thousands of times, and I'm madly in love with it, and I can't get rid of it. But it was around the same time that my Uncle Dan gave me that plastic mug 40 years ago that ordinary water came together with extraordinary plastic to give us single-use bottled water. And the bottled water genie has well and truly now escaped to flood the world. It is perhaps the triumph of marketing over common sense. It's a Frankenstein that's controlled by some of the biggest multinationals in the, in the world, the likes of Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, and Nestle. And they love this product. They love it so much because it contains one simple, cheap ingredient, and that's ordinary water. But this product now threatens to bury our lands and our seas under a blanket of, of glistening plastic lay down to the drum roll of bottles bouncing down the road in the wind. And we even have, at least in Australia, bottled water for dogs. On that year around the Mediterranean, I mean, it was a year of incredible human kindnesses, endless human generosities. 
It was a year of amazing landscapes and seascapes. But the number one negative for me in that whole year was the plastic. And the plastic in the sea, on the shore, and on the land. It was everywhere. And the number one item there was the, water, the, the empty plastic water bottle. This photo could be in any of those countries I went through in the Mediterranean. I won't say where it is because it could be any of them. But we know all of this now. We've, we've heard about these gyres, these swirling masses of plastic soup that occupy vast areas of the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. We've seen the images of the seabirds, their stomachs dissected to remove the plastic inside them, and the same with the fish. We've seen the photos of the turtles with plastic straws round up their noses, and they can't breathe anymore. And only two weeks ago, I learned of the shearwater, this bird, a bird of the southern oceans, which now, when it goes to fish for food, to catch food for its young, can't differentiate between plastic and fish. And it takes a stomach full of plastic and fish back to the nest and feeds it to its young. But we know all this. We know the scale of the problem. We know that some 12 million tons of plastic a year go into the oceans and the seas. 12 million tons. We hear that perhaps by the year 2050, there's going to be more plastic in the seas than there are fish. And I don't think we're ever going to be able to eat plastic fish. So what are we going to do, all of us? So I'm going to take you now to Australia. I'm going to take you to my beautiful little town of Bundanoon, an extraordinary town that did something very, very ordinary. And Bundanoon sits about 150 kilometers south of Sydney. And we sit on the edge of this beautiful national park of waterfalls and cliffs and rivers. It's, it's, a, it's a spectacular spot. And about 10 years ago, we were having a campaign against a company that wanted to take out 50 million liters of water from the aquifer on the edge of our town by the national park. And we were fighting against this because we didn't know the impact on the national park of doing this. We didn't really want the trucks to be going through our town taking this water to Sydney to put in plastic bottles. And we certainly didn't want to be part of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of plastic bottles that were being then to be filled with Bundanoon water. And so it was around that time of that campaign that I wrote an article in our town magazine. And in that article, I posited the idea that if we didn't want this water extraction plant in town, then perhaps we shouldn't have the end product. Did Bundanoon have the bottle to get rid of bottled water? And when this article came out, quite a few people in town got in touch and said, hey, Hugh, it's a great idea, but how are we going to do it? And we formed this group of amazing individuals, and we looked at how we could go forward to become the world's first bottled water-free town. And we realized early on that we needed to obviously engage with the businesses because we were going to say to the businesses, we want to take away some money from you. We want to take away some sales. And it's never easy to run a small business in a small town. And at the time, I actually had a, a cafe and bike shop in town, so I was actually one of those businesses. So we went to the businesses and said, if this is what the community wants you to do, then we're going to uh, provide you with refillable bottles. And you can sell those bottles to make some you know, revenue. We're going to tell the community or ask the community, if they want you to do this, then the community needs to do more of their shopping in town, in our little town, and not at the big town and the big supermarkets 20 kilometers down the road. And we said we're going to put water fountains down the streets and in the shops so there's water everywhere for people to drink. And finally, that there might be a little bit of media interest in our story. And so we rolled forward with this plan, and we got to July 2009. And we had this community meeting, the biggest ever community meeting in our town. And that community meeting voted overwhelmingly to get rid of bottled water. And that little bit of media interest became an absolute media storm. 
And you know, it was the number one news item in Australia at the time. And on the day of that community meeting and the day after, I did more than 200 interviews in two days with everybody from CNN, the BBC, the New York Times, Al Jazeera, you name it, I spoke to them. And I think the reason they liked our story was that in part, it was the David going up against Goliath of the, the multinationals. But it was very much about a community saying, this is what we want to do. We don't need the government. We don't need the municipality to be involved. We're going to do it. And so we rolled forward towards going bottled water free. And of course, in that time, the, uh, the Coca-Colas and the Nestle's, they weren't very happy. And uh, they reacted incredibly quickly. And within weeks, they'd actually uh, released uh, lightly sparkling bottled water because we were, we were getting rid of still bottled water, the stuff that comes out of the tap. So they produced this lightly sparkling, which was like still bottled water with three or four bubbles in it. And then they went to the media and they said, we don't understand why these people are picking on poor old bottled water. What about orange juice? What about Coca-Cola? And at one point, memorably, they said, we don't understand why the people of Bundanoon won't ban French champagne. And we would have loved it if French champagne came out of our taps in Bundanoon. But we got to September the 26th, 2009. And on that day, the last bottles of water came off the shelves in our town, in the shops and the cafes. And hundreds of people gathered in the streets uh, there with, again, the world's media around us. And we went through to each of the fountains in town, to each of these six beautiful fountains to cut the ribbon and turn on the tap. And I remember getting to the last one, which was at our little school. And I looked around at these hundreds of people and all of these television cameras and thought, how bizarre, how utterly bizarre that all of this interest and all we're doing is drinking tap water. But in Bundanoon, bottled water, oh sorry, in Bundanoon there's no bottled water. In Australia, bottled water is a luxury item. It's twice the price of petrol. It's 2,000 times the price of tap water. And our tap water in, in Australia is generally fantastic, as it is here in Greece. And I, indeed, when I did that 50 days of kayaking along your coastline, I didn't drink a single bottle of bottled water. I drank tap water all of the way, no problems at all. It's a different story when you go to the developing world. And in these countries, often bottled water is incredibly cheap. And the problem with that is then the government says, well, hey, we don't need to improve the municipal drinking water supply because the people, they've got bottled water. But the problem with that is that in a lot of these countries, there's a very poor garbage collection service and often next to no recycling. And so all you end up with is millions and millions of bottles just being cast out across the land into the waterways and down the seas. And the other aspect in these countries is that it's often the very poorest of the poor who can't even afford that cheap bottled water, and they're the ones who are left to drink the unimproved domestic water supply. Now, I mentioned recycling. And recycling is really important. We have to recycle more of the products that we need to use. But in many ways, recycling is the refuge of the non-committed. It's an unnecessary use of unnecessary resources for an unnecessary product. So what's the answer? The answer is ultimately to just kick the habit and stop using this particular product. And it's not for government to tell us to do that. It's for us as individuals and in our communities to try and do some of the things like we did in Bundanoon nearly 10 years ago. It's up to you guys because you absolutely are the most powerful agents for change in any of this sort of thing. And in three days' time, 
it's World Environment Day on June the 5th. And this year, the theme is beat plastic pollution. And I've never known there to be so much awareness now as there's been in the last 12, 18 months. I mean, great things are starting to be done here in Greece and across the world. Every day there's a new initiative or a new report to scare us about the massive size of this problem. And it's really good now to have that awareness because I think, like any addiction, like an alcoholic, recognizing you have a problem is half of the battle because then you can go forward and to find a solution. And so, what I want to ask you guys to do today is to, for the sake of our oceans, for the sake of our birds, our animals, and fish, and in many ways for our own sake, is to do something pretty ordinary, very ordinary. And that's to say that perhaps plastic is not so fantastic, and to pledge to give up any or all of these single-use plastic items, to give up bottled water, to give up plastic straws, or to give up takeaway drinks containers. Thank you very much. <laughs>